Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first Starker Lecture of 2024. I'm Mark Swanson. I serve as the Starker Chair in Private and Family Forestry. And to begin this meeting, we're really privileged to have Dr. Christina Eisenberg, who is our Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence and the Maybell Clark McDonald Director of Tribal Initiatives to present us with a land acknowledgement. Dr. Eisenberg. Okay, Nisto Anagok Nistaki Kakatusaki. I'm here to um, present a decolonized land acknowledgement or to take all of us collectively beyond the land acknowledgement. So this image is of this lovely oak, also known as a wolf tree. You see the oak's limbs are extended like this. Um, I took that picture on Easter Sunday. I went for a long run up into the hills. I'm a trail runner um, to the northwest of town. And um, in that forest, you see these wolf trees as they're called. And they are elders and ancestors. Their shape tells a story of what this land used to look like and who lived here. So they are, um, this used to be Oak Savannah, and that is at the very top of one of the hills to the northwest of town. And that was used to be covered with grass with these big old oak trees and was maintained by the Kalapuyan people. So I call them Kalapuyan Hills. And today in that understory, it's choked out by Doug firs right now, but you still see sometimes this time of year and about a month from now, usually around Mother's Day, the camas start to bloom and there's tiny vestiges of the camas, but this was maintained very intentionally by indigenous people. So every time I'm in these woods, I feel hope, you know, these are the stories that are still embedded in that landscape and that in places like the College of Forestry and the good work that we do, such as some of the work that Mark Swanson is doing, um, is to restore those relationships. So if you pull up the next slide. The first thing I did when I started my job here in September of 2022, the very first thing I did was I wrote um, a decolonized version of the land acknowledgement. Now that was kind of a radical thing to do because the land acknowledgement we use at OSU is the one that everybody's supposed to use and it was formally approved by the university and it was a two year process with a strong lack of consensus from tribal nations about what, whether we should have one and if so, what should be in it. And finally, after this fraught process, they came up with what you've seen on the OSU website. And so I said, well, that doesn't quite work for me. There's really good things in there, but there's other things that don't quite work. And so I, I wrote, um, my version of it. And then I sent it out for peer review to leaders from the nine tribes of Oregon, and they gave it a big thumbs up. And then um, I, I had university leaders and my supervisor, Tom DeLuca and Randy, you know, a variety of folks look at it. And everybody said, great, this is beautiful, you use it. And so this is the land acknowledgement that um, I use that Tom DeLuca uses for the projects on which we're partners. So we are committed to taking people and in the institutions with whom we work beyond the land acknowledgement to find ways to support and empower indigenous peoples and their communities. We are mindful of the truth that for thousands of years, the Mary's River or Mpinipu Band of the Kaupuya have been in relationship with the land where Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon now sits and we now live and work. We acknowledge that they were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon and that their living descendants are part of the Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde community of Oregon and the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians. We value the long and deep interactions they have with the land and aspire to find ways to honor and manifest that value in our work and lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eisenberg.
Thank you so much for providing that land acknowledgement. I believe that if Professor Leopold were here today, he would encourage Native peoples to poignantly and emphatically tell their story of stewardship of the land and their active relationship with the landscape. And he would also encourage the rest of us not merely to listen, but to work towards a richer, more equitable land society relationship that deeply reflects and incorporates Indigenous traditional knowledge. I'm honored to be involved in the lecture series named for and supported by the Starker family and Starker Forest Incorporated. We have here today Mr. Bon Starker and Mrs. Anna Starker May joining us via Zoom, along with others from the Starker Forest Organization. The Starkers are, in fact, related to the Leopolds, sharing family roots in Burlington, Iowa, where there is today the Starker Leopold Historic District, which is recognized on the National Register of Historic Places. Each family branched out from there. Uh, to important and distinct roles in the history of North American conservation and global conservation as well. So warm thanks are due to the Starkers. Thank you for being here today. I would also like to thank our Dean, Dr. Tom DeLuca, um, and his office for their support of this event. Dr. DeLuca is away today, and in his place, I'm honored to be able to provide a few introductory remarks. I'd like to thank as well the coordinating committee for this year's Starker lectures, including uh, Julie Woodward, Anna Starker May, Laurel Sherman, Dr. John Nairn and Jessica Fitzmorris. In particular, Jessica Fitzmorris was centrally involved in the planning for Mr. Huffaker's visit here and uh, this lecture, and she helped make my job much easier. So thanks to all of you. Appreciate your help. I also want to thank um, Irene Shopey and uh, the folks from IT for making this pop possible here today. And now I'd like to welcome our guest, the inaugural speaker for this, this year's Starker Lectures, Mr. Buddy Huffaker, Executive Director of the Aldo Leopold Foundation. Mr. Huffaker's background is in landscape uh, architecture and in plant ecology, two fields that certainly resonated with Professor Leopold, the aesthetic and the scientific, the design oriented and the research oriented. These fields complement each other to a very great degree. We cannot achieve the kind of sustainability that Professor Leopold and others envisioned if the practical and the scientific are not just balanced, but blended. The Aldo Leopold Foundation strives to do just that, use tools ranging from ecological restoration to leadership training and community education to forge a future in which the land ethic creates harmony between humans and the land. They conserve the famous shack, of course, but they do much more than that. And the shack, by the way, is a beautiful symbol Professor Leopold didn't build a large, luxurious vacation home. He and his wife, Estella, repurposed a chicken coop as a place to recreate with their five precocious children while, as a family, they explored, restored, and recreated on an abandoned Dust Bowl farm. Take only what you need and give back as much as you can was the implied sentiment. And those five children, Starker, Luna, Nina, Carl, and Estella, each went on to important places in the scientific world, most particularly in the world of conservation science. You know, one thing that really encouraged me about Buddy's bio statement is that he, at times in his career, has worked with diverse tools like field botany, chainsaws, and drip torches. Professor Leopold had an awful lot to say about the power of simple tools like those. And I quote from a Sand County Almanac, when some remote ancestor of, of ours invented the shovel, they became a giver, they could plant a tree. And when the ax was invented, they became a taker. They could chop it down. I think that today, with our advances in the understanding of fire, Professor Leopold might add a further statement with the drip torch or the fire bundle, such as used by indigenous people around the world. They could also become a beneficial moderator of landscapes. I quote again, a conservationist is one who is humbly aware that with each stroke, they're writing their signature on the face of their land. Our choice of writing instruments, so to speak, is more diverse than it ever has been before. And I ask, are we choosing to write our signatures wisely and with sufficient boldness and humility? We're gathered here today because of the legacy of a person who knew how vulnerable nature was and that humankind who in the past was painfully aware of their tenuous reliance upon nature is now painfully aware that nature is increasingly reliant upon us if it is to survive in function, in diversity, and in beauty. Alda Leopold, by weaving together the insight of an accomplished ecologist and the creative prose of a poet, yes, he was a poet, among other things, holds out to us more than anything hope. Hope that we can and will undertake the effort required to understand the diverse mysteries of nature and what it takes to live in harmony with the ecosystems of this earth. 
hope that the actions of one enlightened landowner, volunteer, scientist, or citizen can radiate outwards to forever change history for the better. Hope that the trumpeting of cranes, the crackle of fire among the pines, the howl of wolves, the sky dance of woodcocks, and the expansive majesty of wilderness will not just persist among our descendants, but be known to them, be loved by them, and in turn be stewarded by them. It has now been 75 years since the first publication of a Sand County Almanac. Leopold, of course, did not live to see it in print. I expect he could have imagined a response from some portion of the public, but I wonder if he could have foreseen its revered place on the bookshelf of global conservation and if I might be so bold, a fine entry among the works of human philosophy. My hope is that as we engage in our own actions of conservation or conservation thought, we do as if our efforts shall, like a Sand County Almanac and his other written works, bear fruit far beyond our imagining. I think that is what the professor would have wanted. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Buddy. Thank you so much for coming all the way west to be with us today. And by the way, uh, he may be too modest to bring up this point, but I want to throw in a little side note that his son, Jake, just yesterday morning, as he and I were driving down to the Andrews Experimental Forest, was in the process of delivering his master's thesis in geology. It had something to do with uh, experimentation to uh, learn about the formative conditions under which rare earth minerals are concentrated. That's about all I can explain. Yeah, something like that. But he was checking his phone. I thought, well, he's pretty engrossed in that. And he, he explained that his son at that moment was defending his thesis. So Jake Huffaker, Master of Science in Geology, we salute you wherever you are. And buddy, thank you so much again for coming out to be with us. Thanks, Mark. And thanks all of you for joining us today. switch technologies here maybe oh we don't need you'll see plenty of that <laughs> uh well thanks dr eisenberg and uh, dr swanson for the warm welcomes and thanks to all of you for joining us here today greetings uh, Oregon State University College of Forestry, it's terrific to be with you as part of the 75th anniversary of the Sand County Almanac. Uh, I'm going to guess some of you have read the book before. So let me ask this question. Anybody here never read a Sand County Almanac? Got a couple. Great. That's what we love. Uh, new converts. So we're going to tell a little bit of the story of a Sand County Almanac. Why, uh, as Mark described so eloquently, we're still talking about it, what we continue to learn from Leopold, where we might need to be headed. Uh, but this is an important year in the Leopold legacy because we're celebrating two significant events, 75th anniversary of the Sand County Almanac <clears throat> and the 100th anniversary of the Gila Wilderness area. Anybody know where the Gila Wilderness is? Shout it out. New Mexico, New Mexico outside of Silver City, New Mexico. It was the first wilderness ever uh, recognized. It predated the Wilderness Act by 40 years. Uh, and it was an uh, idea and vision that Leopold had, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, as a young forester in the Southwest. I do want to thank the U.S. Forest Service, who owns and manage, manages the Gila Wilderness Area and the Gila National Forest now. Uh, we are embarking on a collaboration with the Forest Service uh, to elevate a land ethic and a conservation ethic uh, in our country, and so we're excited about partnering with them in this exciting year. Now, if you've not read a Sand County Almanac, we have a deal for you. For $7.50, in honor of the 75th anniversary, you can get your own copy. You can't get it cheaper anywhere. Uh, so, uh, or if you need another copy or a copy to give a friend or family member, uh, please visit our website. Uh, and then later in this year, uh, end of May, beginning of June, there will be events down in Silver City Again, kind of revisiting this idea of wilderness, where it's at, past, present, future, uh, where we're going uh, with different activities and events if you want to travel down south. Um, we just wrapped up Leopold Week, uh, so we have some amazing programs uh, that uh, we did uh, kind of celebrating this significant year. And then we have ongoing programs each month. Uh, that explore a topic of a land ethic in different ways. And so uh, I don't know if folks have read this book. It was recognized by the New York Times as one of the most important scientific books in 2023. 
Uh, ben Goldfarb is in the kind of independent environmental journalist, wrote an amazing book, talks a lot about uh, Oregon and some of the work on fish, fish passages uh, and, and kind of highways and byways uh, providing habitat for wildlife. So join us on April 11th if you want to continue the conversation. But back to the Sand County Almanac, uh, I believe this is the most important passage from the whole book. It comes very early on in the foreword to the Sand County Almanac, where he writes, when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Now, I've read a lot of Aldo Leopold. This, I believe, is, for a scientific crowd, the most close if then statement Leopold ever makes. If this, then that. If we see land as a community, we will begin to use it with love and respect. And how I put that in my own words is what he was challenging us to recognize is that we are part of the land community. And if we recognize that, then we'll extend the same ethical consideration and care that we do our friends and family. Right, the same consideration to the flora and fauna as we do our friends and family. And so uh, this was his challenge to the reader. And then we'll go through kind of where that challenge came from and what he was trying to, take the, the journey he was trying to take the reader on. <clears throat> now, this room is probably very much aware of the evidence that shows, in fact, right now we're not living up to this if-then statement, right? We're, we're not seeing land as us and us as land uh, and so last year, hottest year on record, we're probably already outpacing this this year. Uh, additional data just shows everything is moving in the wrong direction uh, at this point. So we have plenty of evidence that, that we're not seeing land as a community. And then the next most important passage out of a Sand County Almanac comes near the very end where Leopold writes, I have purposely presented the land ethic as a product of social evolution because nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the minds of the thinking community. In other words, Leopold knew as soon as he was writing this that the world was going to change. And a land ethic, our, our, our understanding of our relationship to each other in the natural world would have to continue to evolve and change. And with this passage, he is inviting all of us to be part of the conversation, be part of the process, to be part of the future of conservation. He effectively was inviting us to the party 75 years ago. Now, just a quick little biographical sketch, uh, because oftentimes we read Leopold and it still sounds and feels pretty contemporary. But Leopold grew up and was born in 1887 in Burlington, Iowa, the family business was a natural resource business, the Leopold Desk Company, I love this logo, built on honor to endure. Uh, and so Leopold loved to be outside. Any chance he got, he was hunting, he was fishing, he was hiking, he was camping. Um, he absolutely loved to be outside. Oop. And <clears throat> they would often spend the summers up on Lake Huron because his mother had really significant allergies. Uh, and so it was a place that they could go to get some respite. Now, here we are, a natural resource uh, based family business. And as they would travel through the upper Midwest, this is what they would see the great cutover, right? And they were seeing uh, really their whole means of livelihood disappear in front of, of their eyes. And so Leopold, because of his kind of professional interest in the family business and personal interest in being outdoors, uh, wanted to pursue some opportunity in conservation. Now, also remember, this is all happening really when these ideas are first emerging for all intents and purposes. Folks are probably familiar with these photos, Penny Roosevelt and John Muir, the kind of great protectionist, if you will. Uh, and then on the other side, Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service, kind of the wise use uh, concept. And Leopold is often positioned to be kind of that space in the middle, connecting between needing to protect wild places, but understanding that we are human beings, that we are consumptive uh, organisms, and that we needed resources uh, in order to, to survive uh, and to prosper. So <clears throat> Leopold, uh, at that point, 
Uh, Yale was barely predates the Oregon State University or the precursor Oregon Agricultural College. Um, and so really the opportunity for Leopold to pursue a conservation career or degree was at the Yale School of Forestry, where he ends up getting his master's degree in 1909, the fifth graduating class, one year before T.J. Starker is amongst the first graduates of this program here at Oregon State, um, and joins the U.S. Forest Service. Now, Aldo is already sticking out. If you see the class photo, he's the young man in the front row in, a, in the light-colored suit. And he goes to the wild country, the Southwest. He gets off the train uh, in Arizona. It's still a territory. It's not even a state yet in 1909 and serves on the Apache National Forest. He would spend several decades in the Southwest and had many significant uh, experiences and events, but probably the most significant was finding the love of his life, Estella Berger. Uh, she came from a very prominent Hispanic family, uh, major sheep grazers in New Mexico. And by all accounts, this was a lifelong love affair. They were each other's confidants. She was his primary chief editor of all of his writing over the years, uh, and just a really strong relationship that would uh, continue to the end of his life. And because of the nature of this relationship and Estella's own cultural background, it also introduced Leopold to a lot of different dimensions that he wouldn't have experienced in the upper Midwest. <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, they had, their family uh, was part of the Luna land grant and, and had um, a grazing allotment in New Mexico. And Leopold's first job on some of these national forests was to ensure that overgrazing did not occur. So those had to be some interesting conversations around the dinner table, right? Like, where are those sheep going? How many do you got out there? Um, and then also, Mrs. Leopold's favorite sister, sibling, was Nina Otero Warren. And Nina was a really strong woman suffragette and also one of the primary advocates against the Indian boarding school. So again, it tells you a little bit of the kind of context and conversations that were happening. And in fact, Nina was such a force. Uh, she is one of the prominent women in American history that's been honored with a US quarter. Uh, so you can add that to your collection. So again, Leopold was working in the Southwest, worried about overgrazing, trying to assess the forestry uh, productivity capacity down there, but became really concerned, especially after a year as the secretary of the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce, that development was gonna roll over our wild lands. And this is happening at the same times that the good roads movement was happening in the 1920s. The automobile had busted onto the scene, kind of literally, and was driving everywhere. And <clears throat> Leopold was very much concerned about what this was gonna do to our wild landscape. And this is largely his concern that and experiencing firsthand the kind of overdevelopment of the Grand Canyon at that same time period that he began to worry about the ability of national forests or national parks to actually protect uh, the, the, the special nature of wild places. And he visits the Gila for the first time in 1919. Uh, it sparks his imagination, though it lays a little latent for a while. And then uh, he writes about this idea for the first time in 1921, using the term wilderness for the first time in his writing. And it's really that uh, the highest use, so right, he's out of this Gifford Pinchot school, very directly as an employee, the, uh, the greatest good for the greatest number for the greatest amount of time. Did I get that right, Don? Yeah. That's the Gifford Pinchot mentality. And so it was all about the highest use. And Leopold begins to question what the highest use might be. Maybe we need to expand the definition of that. And that in fact, we need to set aside some places that are so special that they could never be recreated. And he identified the Gila as one such place. 
750,000 acres, uh, wild, diverse. And so he comes up with this idea and proposes it to the leadership of the Forest Service in 1922. In 1922, um, and it kind of works its way up through the hierarchy. And in 1924, the Forest Service leadership designates the Gila as the first ever wilderness area protected only by a policy document, an internal policy document at that point in time. Now, Leopold wouldn't even be there for the signing of that management plan. One week before it was signed, he got transferred and moved to Madison, Wisconsin to be the assistant director of the U.S. Forest Products Lab. He worked that administrative job for about four years, um, was not really very fulfilled, uh, and left that to pursue his primary passion, which was wildlife. And often people talk about a St. County Almanac as a kind of example of Leopold's visionary thinking. I point to his first book, Game Management, as a real testament to his foresight because he begins working on this manuscript in 1931. He's now he's a contractor uh, getting paid by any outfit that would he would he could find that would pay him to do wildlife surveys across the upper Midwest, mainly documenting whether uh, hunting was going to be a viable activity into the future. Because, uh, you know, was there going to be wildlife to hunt? So he starts working on the book in 1931, publishes it in 1933, which then qualifies him uh, to be hired by the University of Wisconsin to teach the first course ever on game management. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin. So he starts writing a textbook for a field that doesn't exist until he writes a textbook. Uh, in 1933, he's appointed the chair of the game management uh, department at uh, University of Wisconsin. And he gives his first talk ever starting to think and articulate this idea of ethics, conservation ethics, in 1933. Now, we talk a lot about climate change and the ecological challenges that our generation faces, but a lot of generations have faced ecological calamity and disaster. For Leopold's, it was the Dust Bowl, uh, where really uh, you know, a cloud of dust traveled all the way from the Great Plains to Washington, D.C. in 1934. And this was what he was facing and the upper Midwest was facing. So what does he do? His family purchases this farm along the Wisconsin River, about an hour north of Madison, and they start planting trees. And they plant 3,000 trees a year, 1,000 red pine, 1,000 white pine, 1,000 jack pine. For the first four years, as the drought persists, they all die. They come back out that fifth year and plant 3,000 more trees. Now, there would have been a rebellion in my family long before year five, probably led by me, uh, be, in, in terms of coming back out and, and doing all that work. They planted over 40,000 trees, planted hardwoods, technically did the second prairie restoration ever uh, in the world. And Leopold gets inspired by these experiences. You know, he was a public servant. He was a professor. Now he's a private landowner. He has to do this with his own time, with his own treasure. And he's not always successful. It turns out it's actually a lot of hard work to take care of a piece of ground and to get trees to grow. And so he begins to realize that conservation was really going to be predicated upon getting everybody involved. And so he starts writing with a different tone and for different audiences beyond just the academic audience. The first kind of poetic essay that he writes was the thick-billed parrot, later renamed Guacamaya, when published in a San County Almanac. And that was published in 1937 in the journal Condor. Now, I don't know if people know the journal Condor, but it's a technical journal for ornithology. Leopold basically gets a poem published in a technical journal. So it shows you a little bit the prominence of, of his name in the field. And then uh, about a decade later, he would write Great Possessions uh, about kind of transcending private land ownership. <clears throat> Another important thing happens in 1935. They buy this farm. Uh, they go visit it in February for the first time. And then Leopold goes off for two trips. He goes to 
uh, the Sierra Madres in Mexico, and he goes to Germany. And the Sierra Madre trip was a hunting trip. He uh, writes about that being the first time he actually saw a truly healthy land. Uh, and then he goes to Germany and is confronted with the stark contrast of a very manipulated managed landscape. And so he's comparing these in his mind. And so uh, this further stimulates him to think about where conservation is headed. He writes another uh, kind of popular essay in 1937 titled Marshland Elegy. This is his elegy to the Sandhill Crane. He's expecting the Sandhill Crane to go at least extirpated in the Midwest, if not extinct across North America. Population was on dramatic decline. Not quite sure what's going on there, but... Um, <clears throat> And so uh, these are starting to bundle in his mind as he writes more and more of these essays that perhaps he could compile them into a manuscript that could be presented to a wider readership. And so we're transitioning now to the construction, the true construction of a Sand County Almanac. Of the 41 essays that would ultimately be published in the book, 17 had been previously published. So he's writing them for a different audience. And again, he's starting to see how they might hang together. And then some pretty noted uh, outlets, American Forest, The Condor, Audubon Magazine, a couple journals, Outdoor America. And then another really important backdrop that sometimes doesn't get mentioned is he's writing all of this with World War II looming in the background. He also has time to write because most of his students are off fighting in the war. And his two sons are off one in the Pacific Theater uh, uh, and one in the United States, but uh, Luna doing meteorological uh, an analysis about where and how the Allied troops could uh, be most effective. <clears throat> so again, the Dust Bowl comes through World War II. He's seen assaults on humanity and how those assaults on humanity are also affecting the ecological integrity of the landscape. So he gets much more serious and has more time to be working on this manuscript. And this is a passage from the first foreword to the book. This is not the ultimate foreword. This is not the foreword that has when land is a community, when we see land as a community. This was his first foreword that was much more biographical. Um, and he writes, I do not imply that this philosophy of land was always clear to me. It was rather the end result of a life journey, <clears throat> in the course of which I have felt sorrow, anger, puzzlement, or confusion. Any of you ever experienced that? Those emotions? Or confusion over the inability of conservation to halt the juggernaut of land abuse. These essays describe particular episodes en route. So, what he decides to do is construct this manuscript that is going to take the reader on a journey. The journey begins by just understanding the natural world. Part one kind of describes what he and his family is doing on this farm. That's how he and his children are learning to know the land, come to understand it, uh, and come to care about it. So in the April essay, if you remember, he writes about Draba. And he says, within a few weeks now, Draba, the smallest flower that blows, will sprinkle every sandy place with small blooms. And he writes, altogether, it is of no importance, just a small creature that does its job quickly and well. Draba becomes this metaphor for Leopold and the reader about little things that we don't understand what they mean or do, but probably have some bigger functional value and still deserve respect and love, uh, even if we don't understand their full importance. So he takes the reader through each month of the year, and again, you're building knowledge, uh, you're seeing dip, you're accruing different insights and experiences so that you can come to know the land. <clears throat> then part two, you start to put that knowledge into play, right? You're starting to kind of do conservation diagnosis. Uh, and as he says, it tells the reader how and why we're out of step. And of course, this contains some of his most signature essays, Marshland Elegy, 
the Song of the Gobby Line and Thinking Like a Mountain, where he writes about shooting a wolf <clears throat> and seeing the fierce green fire die in its eyes. And it, it's his metaphor for the importance of predators, the importance of paradigm shifts that at one point in his life, he believed that's what you do with predators. You shoot them, you get rid of them. Uh, and then he came to realize that's not true. They, like Draba, have some role to play in the ecosystem, even if we don't fully understand it. Um, and so this becomes, again, one of his most signature essays. Somebody I was talking to today said, that's my favorite, thinking like a mountain. And it's many people's favorite. <clears throat> For a long time, we didn't know whether this was just literary license. Like, we didn't really suspect that Lepel didn't shoot a wolf, but, you know, uh, there was really no documentation of it. And about 15 years ago, finally, uh, a letter was uncovered in a Forest Service office uh, that Leopold had written back to his mother in 1909, that first year he joined the Forest Service and was on the Apache National Forest, uh, where he writes, Dear Mama, Wheatley and I have killed two timber wolves and two turkeys and a lot of grouse, but no deer. And that was it. He goes on to talk about what they ate and where they camped. No profound recollection or reflection about what happened or the importance of predators at that point. He wasn't there in his own thinking, right? I mean, that's an experience that would stew in his mind for 30 years before he would write that essay in 1943. Uh, but he was accruing knowledge. He was understanding the land better and then was looking to create an essay in that middle portion they would challenge people to really think about geologic time, ecological functions, the ability of people to, to do wrong and be absolved uh, <clears throat> and, and to uh, rectify past sins. And so Thinking Like a Mountain becomes that signature essay for him. Then part three is what he says, tells the company how to get back in step. So these are the philosophical essays of the land ethic, wilderness for wildlife, uh, the community concept. And he realizes not everybody's gonna be ready for this, right? The only the sympathetic reader is really gonna wanna wrestle with these philosophical questions. And this again is where the land ethic comes in. One of the passages is called the ecological conscious. He again redefines the concept of a land ethic, simply enlarging the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. Not said, but I think we know now and we understand in his thinking that also meant us, right? That we're part of the land. And that no important change in ethics was ever accomplished without an internal change in our intellectual emphases, loyalties, affections, <clears throat> and convictions. So <clears throat> he's got this manuscript. He's pretty excited about it. Uh, he's had students review it. He's had Costello review it. He's had colleagues review it. Now he wants to get it published. He had been working with Macmillan Press, who expressed quite a bit of interest on early drafts. And then he gets this letter in 1944 from, back from Macmillan. And the top passage that I've kind of highlighted is, we've discussed your essays here and find, while we like your writing, they do not seem suitable for a book. They go down, if you see the bottom section, I wonder if you would consider making a book purely of nature observations with less emphasis on the ecological ideas which you've incorporated in the present manuscript. In other words, ditch the land ethic and we are good to go. Like we like the little essays about the skunk and little Draba, you know, those are fun. We got a readership for this, but this weighty stuff about our relationship to each other in the natural world, well, I don't, we don't think anybody is going to want to read that. Well, of course, that's why we're here, is people have read it, people are trying to digest it, people are trying to understand whether we can step in to that mindset. So <clears throat> he keeps working, he reworks it, he writes a new foreword uh, in which he brings forward this powerful if-then statement. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. The forward also then kind of, as I just showed you, describes to the reader the journey that you're gonna go on. 
So I think as I, I really believe if you read nothing else, those new to a St. Kenny Almanac, read the foreword. That's the cliff notes of a St. Kenny Almanac and Alba Leopold. <clears throat> um, that he really helped the publishers understand what he was trying to do. The previous foreword was just kind of, uh, again, you know, about why you're frustrated and and that it, uh, it was a little bit more dogmatic. This one was much more invitation to the reader uh, to, to be part of the process. And so <clears throat> Oxford University Press writes him, he receives a letter on April 14th, 1948. It was agreed that we are to publish your book, Great Possessions, as illustrated by Charles Schwartz. Now, how many of you have read Great Possessions? Nobody. Okay, one week later, he would die in a grass fire at the shack and farm, up with his wife and daughter, planted trees, <clears throat> suffered a heart attack and passed away. And so he only knew for one week that his book that he'd been working on for 13 years was to be published. And it was to be published, as he understood it, under the title Great Possessions, which was his working title for the manuscript. Uh, when he died, it was front page news, not just in Madison, but it was also in the New York Times. So again, uh, uh, a statement on the prominence he had in the field. <clears throat> but there's a real concern, especially by Oxford University Press, what was going to happen with the manuscript. And so uh, his son, Luna, took over the responsibility of the final editing, working with his students, uh, again, and the family and revising as little as possible um, to the manuscript that their father knew, but getting it ready for final publication, agreeing to one request from Oxford University Press that was to change the title from Great Possessions to a Sand County Almanac. Nobody quite knows where they came up with the name, uh, and it is only referenced quickly in this new foreword that he just written one month, uh, before sending it to Oxford University Press as kind of a passing line in the foreword about the sec first section is a Sand County Almanac. So again, the almanac, the seasons of the year. Now we often, this is a quick transgression or tangent, uh, we often get asked, where is Sand County? Like I'm looking on a map, I cannot find Sand County. There is no Sand County. And the farm actually sits in Sauk County, Wisconsin. The sand counties of Wisconsin are a series of counties that were dramatically impacted by Glacial Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, so geology in Wisconsin starts 13,000 years ago, effectively. Like, we don't have to know all this deep history that you all have here. The glaciers came and, and left at 13,000 years ago and kind of reset the clock uh, from an ecological perspective. <clears throat> but that little red dot, if you can see it, is where the farm is. And so Leopold is talking about this almanac and kind of the ecological phenomenons that would have been occurring across that entire landscape. So <clears throat> the book gets published a year after his death, uh, 1949. Best we know, October 28th uh, was kind of the release date. And it was well received immediately. These are various nature writers and conservation writers at the time that quickly recognized that there was no other kind of writing uh, available, at least to Western audiences, that were asking readers to think in this way. Again, not just these cute nature sketches, but these deeper philosophical questions. <clears throat> so then the book kind of rolls forward. It's being used in wildlife programs, some forestry programs. Um, if a little bit of Leopold is good, Oxford decided more Leopold would be better. And so they decide to come out with Round River. How many people have ever read any of the essays from Round River? You might have and might not even have known it. I'll describe that in just a sec. But these are basically his hunting journals, effectively. And in my opinion, I could say this because Luna Leopold is no longer with us, who kind of curated these, not curated very well. They're just kind of his journal entries. Um, but at any rate, they put it out there, hoping to find an audience. It sells some. And then in 1966, they take those essays and kind of squish it into a San County Almanac. Again, the theory is a little bit of Leopold is good, a lot of Leopold is better. 
Um, and so the first kind of expanded edition comes out in 1966. Now, folks know who this is? Don Waller. St. Rachel. St. Rachel, Rachel Carson. So people probably know, author of Silent Spring. This didn't come out till the 1960s. Before she wrote this book, she was really one of our best nature writers. Uh, these are two very prominent books of hers, The Sea Around Us and The Edge of the Sea. And she was published by Oxford University Press. So they ask Rachel Carson to review Round River, and she was appalled. She called him a charlatan. Now, we have no evidence that Rachel Carson ever actually then read a Sand County Almanac. To Ashley, maybe. She was a very strong uh, animal rights activist. So she may still well not have agreed with Aldo Leopold, but certainly her introduction via Round River uh, did not align with her own uh, values. And so she panned the book. Uh, and she went on to do great things. And maybe fortunately, um, Oxford didn't push Round River quite as strongly, but it already exists out there. And so to be a book that we're still talking about 75 years later, you also have to have a little luck. And some of the luck was that in 1968, Oxford University Press brought the original book back in a paperback edition. And so it was widely available, much more affordable. <clears throat> and then in 1970, how many people's first copy of a Sand County Almanac looks like one of those three? If so, you've read Round River because that edition has the essays from Round River squished into a Sand County Almanac. And Sierra Club book brings this edition out in 1970. Why in 1970? What happened? The first Earth Day. The country is celebrating the first Earth Day. They want to read environmental writing. Well, their options are Henry David Thoreau, Rachel Carson, and Aldo Leopold. And he's available in a paperback edition, so it's affordable. And Oxford University Press and Ballantyne and Sierra Club books recognize a market opportunity. And so they make that paperback edition available extremely cheaply. And so Leopold's kind of lucky. Earth Day, in some ways, kind of, if, if not saved him, that is what introduced Aldo Leopold to the world from a popular sense, from popular readership. This is a quick graph that just demonstrates that in terms of number of copies sold and how important the 1970s were to introducing Leopold to a whole new generation and, and the future of conservation. Now, Dr. Don Waller's written, but how many other people have written a book here? We gotta have a couple other book authors. Christina has written a book. So if you write a book, the job is not just to write the book, right? It's to find your audience. And these days you gotta be an advocate. And, but Leopold had passed away. So again, somewhat good fortune, though he kind of sowed these own seeds, he had a family of advocates that were very prominent in their own fields in science and conservation that were introducing their father's writing and ideas to their own network and community. And it started with Mrs. Leopold. Uh, again, his lifelong partner, his ardent uh, compadre. She became a very uh, prominent environmental advocate in Wisconsin after Aldo's death. And so she was carrying forward the family legacy. And three of the children are in the National Academy of Sciences. No other family has that many members in the National Academy of Sciences. And dad never made it in. He was not a good enough scientist to get elected to the National Academy. Uh, but this was an article as early as 1980 that recognized the impact that all five of the kids were having on the fields of science and conservation. And just quickly, because they really do deserve this respect, a. Starker Leopold. My understanding is that Starker's name is actually a tribute to the Starker family, though there was a Starker uh, lineage in their own family, but, but th this was uh, a nod to a very important family friend. 
uh, who got his PhD in zoology. His career modeled his father's the most of all five kids. He uh, ended up teaching at the University of California, Berkeley. He wrote The Wildlife of Mexico. So if you go to Mexico and you ask, do you know the name Leopold? They'll say, yeah, they're talking about Starker. Uh, and then he also wrote a report in 1963 uh, at the behest of Secretary of Interior uh, Stuart Udall that is called the Leopold Report. And it was it had the potential to be a very Im, uh, Im, impactful report because it was to guide the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Park Service about how they should be managing their properties. Two key components the importance of the use of fire and the importance of predators in ecosystems. Of course, those two recommendations were not really heated um, and we're just now kind of getting back to revisiting those uh, ideas. I also say <clears throat> Starker was kind of the last superpower in the field of conservation. He, at one point, he was the, the interim chancellor for the whole University of California system. He was good friends with David Packard and Bill Hewlett. He was very well networked within the kind of leadership of the United States. Uh, and when he passed, a kind of conservation got fragmented. I mean, not just him, it was the, it was the times. But he was kind of our last uh, big singular player in the conservation field. And he had his own little shack on the bottom right, Sage Chan Research Center. Uh, uh, in California. Then there's Luna Leopold. Luna Leopold uh, is basically, or was basically, the world's foremost geomorphologist. He understood how rivers functioned. Uh, he wrote textbooks about it. My first introduction to Leopold was actually reading Luna B. Leopold's textbook, uh, not a Sand County Almanac. And uh, he, at one point, was the chief hydrologist for the U.S. Geological Survey. He, too, was a professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, he had his own shack uh, in Pinedale, Wyoming, where he studied, uh, again, a river over the course of several decades. Nina Leopold Bradley, uh, she was a plant ecologist with a background in geography. She's the only one of the five who didn't get her formal Ph.D., but she did all sorts of ecological research with her first husband, Bill Elder, and then uh, her second husband, Charles Bradley. In a different time, right, Nina probably would have gotten her PhD, but that's not really something that women were doing at that time. She would come back and retire just down the road from the shack and then resurrected her father's phenological observers, uh, observations and published a paper in 1999. It was one of the first pieces of evidence of biological responses to climate change. Carl Leopold, a plant physiologist, I don't know if you're seeing the trend here, uh, a professor at Purdue University and Cornell, wrote a book, Plant Growth and Development. He started a tropical forestry restoration initiative in Costa Rica, uh, where he was reintroducing, he and his wife were reintroducing native species into Costa Rica instead of exotic species that grew faster, but didn't have all the biological and ecological values. Uh, and then Estella Leopold, who we just lost this past February. Uh, Estella, Luna, and Starker are the three members in the National Academy of Sciences. Estella was a pioneer, a research scientist, a palynologist, so she studied fossil pollen to uh, resurrect and, and reconstruct a past um, vegetation uh, communities in different uh, periods of time. She had her own shack and cabin outside of uh, Denver, Colorado. And um, all five of them, again, had their own extensive kind of personal and professional networks. And then in 1982, uh, they recognized that their father's book is still selling. People are showing up on Nina's doorstep to go see the shack uh, that inspired a St. County Almanac. And so they established the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and they entrusted with two primary assets, the property that was the inspiration for the book and the rights to the book. So we serve as the owner of that historic site and um, <clears throat> as the executor of Leopold's literary estate. And I just always like to point out what an act of generosity and kind of modeling their father's idea this act was, in that they gave up the family farm 
to all of us, to the world, right? They, they gave up their exclusive interest and ownership rights. They knew that people would be coming. They knew they had certain obligations as a nonprofit organization to make that open and accept, accessible to others. And so they invested in this concept of community and took two key assets that they had and shared them with the rest of the world. And early on, what they invested in was trying to ensure we understood the Leopold legacy. And so there are kind of, again, you have to, you have to be a little bit lucky. You have to have some advocates. In this way, Leopold got both. Uh, Dr. Susan Flotter did her dissertation on Leopold. There's a whole fun story about how uh, that wasn't really her project she wanted to do, but the project she wanted to do, she wasn't able to do, so she fell back on Aldo Leopold. That was the first scholarly work that introduced Leopold to the world. Kurt Miney expanded upon that and did the definitive biography at the end of the 1980s <clears throat> that really documented what we know and don't know about Leopold's life and his work and where this idea of a land ethic came from. And then Bear Calicott, environmental philosopher in 1989, put the first real kind of academic piece together that, that tried to understand and document the land ethic from a philosophical perspective. So the family kind of helped invest in transitioning this work from academic work to publication uh, and getting it out into the world. This is more correlative and causative, but you can see up to 1980, these are citations of a Sand County Almanac in academic literature. So that's what this graph is plotting. And you can see up to 1980, it's, it's just kind of bumping along with the advent of this scholarship uh, and the understanding of the, of the Leopold legacy, things begin to grow exponentially. <clears throat> Another thing they did, and I'm sharing this for any of the students in the audience, so this is another bit of a tangent, is they created a fellowship program. The first generation of the fellows came and did ecological studies uh, on the avian community, small mammal community, botanical community. Um, and now it's transitioned where this is a 12-month experience. Uh, you come spend a year with us. We have, in addition to your kind of day-to-day -day work responsibilities, we have a professional development program that hangs over that on all these subjects so that when you leave us, you're ready to take your next step, either graduate school uh, or uh, on to your uh, next conservation professional position. And you get to live at the Future Leader Center. It's a really cool spot, um, a living and learning center. We will post uh, openings for applications in December. So for students that are going to graduate next year, this time, uh, be thinking about coming to spend a year with us. And this is kind of then where our alumni is all across the country. And that program is important to us today because that's also our human capacity to do a lot of the work that we do. And so fellows uh, help lead tours of now the National Historic Landmark. We have people come from literally all over the world to see this historic site. Um, and then we continue to own and manage the farm. The foundation owns 6, 600 acres that sits within a nested within 4,400 acres, nested within 10,000 acres that we do di different levels of conservation uh, management actions on that are in response to historical data of what we know about what the landscape looked like when the general land survey was done. So that's looking backwards. Also, just to overlay the physiographic elements of, the, of uh, our part of the world. Again, I talked about the sand counties uh, and why they're there and what that means in terms of what kind of ecological communities we can support. Uh, and then also, perhaps most importantly, is from a conservation perspective, what we can impact most. And so grassland birds are, of any other guild of species, the most in decline across North America. In particular, in Wisconsin, we have uh, serious challenges with habitat loss due to just habitat loss, but also changing agricultural practices. So hay, which was a really important crop in the Midwest uh, ro crop rotation, is basically gone now from our landscape. It's just corn and beans. And so those are surrogate grasslands that are gone now. Uh, and so uh, where we had grassland and savannas, we uh, had species that were really struggling for habitat. 
And then we're also looking forward to climate change, climate change predictions uh, and the role of grassland ecosystems in our part of the world to be resilient uh, and sequester almost as much carbon as forests given the, the, the poor soils that we have. And so this is how we're monitoring for our work to try to understand whether we're at fact providing habitat uh, for uh, the species that we care about. And again, the fellows are the labor force to do that. So they get trained on how to do prescribed burning. They get trained about how to run a chainsaw and how to drive a tractor and some really practical aspects of doing conservation work. Uh, and not only in terms of really understanding how hard conservation work is, but it's amazing the confidence it gets built when you learn how to run a chainsaw and drop a tree and know that you could do that and know why you picked that tree and why it's coming down. Uh, but we did this, we were doing this for uh, probably 15 years while I was there. And we also realized that we were just not kind of having the habitat impact that we wanted. So we also invested in some bigger equipment. The commercial timber uh, harvester is not ours, but we do regularly have uh, a professional forester come in uh, and take out trees and put those into the wood supply uh, stream. And then we have a fecon mower to help suppress woody brush, which is our primary uh, challenge in the upper Midwest for grasslands. And these are ambassadors. <clears throat> so these are what we're monitoring for. Those little circles are telling us whether we have them or not and how many. You'll see the sandhill crane in the middle there. And that is one of our conservation success stories. When Leopold wrote Marshland Elegy, there were at best estimated to be 100 sandhill cranes in the state of Wisconsin. Now we have 100,000 in the Midwest flyway, thanks to changing uh, conservation policies, primarily uh, hunting regulations and habitat improvement. Um, Sandhill cranes have rebounded. And in fact, now, right behind the shack on the Wisconsin River, we have 15,000 cranes come in every night to roost uh, on the sandbars in the Wisconsin River. Um, and it, it just is a magnificent experience. So if you're ever looking for a fall trip, come see us in late October or November uh, to see 15,000 Sandhill cranes. And we celebrate that now every fall of the year with our neighbor, the International Crane Foundation that has their own origin story connected to a Sand County Almanac and the Leopold legacy. Uh, and we have people come from all over the upper Midwest. All this operates out of the Leopold Center, uh, which was built in 2007, out of the very trees that Aldo and Estella and their family planted. So the entire building, the entire structural skeleton is pine planted by the family. We also continue to bring the book out in different formats, uh, uh, a photo illustrated edition, 2013. Uh, it was included in the Library of America. If you're not familiar with that, that's kind of one of the, our, the United States kind of Hall of Fame for important literature. Uh, and so trying to ensure that a Santa County Almanac stays in the conservation conversation. We also did a film, Green Fire, to bring it out in a different format to not only tell the life of Leopold, but how the land ethic continues to inform and inspire conservation across the country. And really what we're trying to do now is connect back up with the Academy. What we know is most people get introduced to San County Almanac on a college course uh, of some kind. And so in 2018, with some colleagues, we did a survey of graduate programs just to understand uh, where philosophy of uh, conservation, conservation philosophy sits within the curriculum. Uh, because what we're hearing from employers is that never have they had a potential workforce that knows more about ecology, uh, is more well-versed in the science and, and policy aspects, but often don't have the, the kind of critical thinking, the ability to under, understand and navigate the complex realities of conservation solutions in today's world. And so we were interested, well, at the graduate level then, our, our programs investing in that. And mainly what we found is no. And the rationale we got was that there's just not time in the curriculum. We only have a master's student for two years. 
uh, or a PhD student for five years. We got a lot they got to know. They got a lot they got to do. Uh, so it just didn't seem practical. So then we went to the undergraduate level to try to understand what was happening. <clears throat> we did a nationwide survey. And what we found is that, yes, faculty thought environmental ethics was really important. Uh, those are the 91, 92% uh, data points. 57 felt that 57% thought their uh, institution, their department, their college placed an emphasis on that. So that told us there might be an opportunity there. And 76% 70 believe that even they as an individual faculty member could do a better job. And so we're trying to understand, that's one of the things we're interested in is what do you all need? Uh, what kind of elements, activities, curriculum modules could we help develop that could be useful uh, for your students, for you and your students? And that's part of what we want to continue to do is grow this conservation movement, create a real national land ethic movement. Uh, and here are the elements that we believe are important. One is that <clears throat> conservation is going to have to continue to build on kind of economic models of conservation. So one of the kind of prototypical ones, right, is in New York City's watershed, that instead of a treatment plant, uh, they invested in land protection, waterfalls in the Catskills by rain, uh, and gets uh, directed to New York City, Manhattan, as clean drinking water. Uh, but we also have to continue to move towards an ecological worldview, away from just an economic, strictly worldview to economic worldview. Two is that the land ethic will have to connect better to individual and community health benefits resulting from access to the natural world. So this kind of sprung onto the scene in some ways for maybe not for this room, but for others during COVID and the pandemic when people realized how important it was to be outside and have access to that. Uh, what does that look like? How do we help others understand that? How do we ensure everybody has access uh, to those health benefits? And the land ethic will have to extend across the landscape. So from designated wilderness areas or really uh, protected landscapes all the way to backyard habitats and to working landscapes in between. I had the chance to go to the Starker Forest today. Uh, we need to connect uh, the landscape up and have conservation practices across the landscape. The Land Institute, if people are familiar with that, are trying to develop a perennial polyculture where we could grow uh, the, the, the calories that we need through uh, a modified prairie-like agricultural system uh, so that we're not tilling up the ground and planting corn and beans every year. And then again, where people are at, we need to help them find nature in their backyard and window boxes uh, and then ensure that these things all connect up to and then finally, the land ethic will need to embrace and be embraced by new constituencies. And Mark talked about a Sand County Almanac as being part of kind of the global foundation of environmental literature. That's certainly true. Book has been translated into 15 different languages. Um, we have ambassadors and advocates out there. This is uh, Dr. Ufuk Ozdog, who translated Sand County Almanac into Turkish and now has a Leopold Education Project effort in uh, Turkey, where she is not just introducing people to a Sand County Almanac, that is what she's doing, but they're doing community development projects uh, to connect economic needs and opportunities with citizens in Turkey to ecological solutions uh, and trying to ensure that their community can embrace and empower one another uh, to find economic and ecological solutions. And then that's what we've been trying to do with a lot of our programming through Leopold Week and these virtual programs uh, that will roll forward over the course of the year is recognize and, and identify and amplify voices that are coming from different cultural practices and backgrounds. So that we can, again, make sure that everybody is part of this conversation, that we're listening and learning to one another uh, to, to grow a richer conversation. So uh, we're interested in your ideas and thoughts. We just launched a new website and don't have this funnel built yet. So for now, you'll just have to bomb me with emails. Uh, if there are examples that you know of or that you're working on that fit within this uh, framework, 
or pieces of literature that we should be sure to be aware of. Uh, but we want your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions and experiences. And we want you to join the conversation. Uh, and so the best way you can do that uh, is to sign up for our e-newsletter. And you, what you'll get is you'll get two emails a month. One is kind of fun. There are little quizzes, little trivia things. Uh, and the other will be land ethic content, uh, essays that explore these ideas and these issues. Um, and uh, already talked with some faculty here about some work that's happening here that we could uh, identify and highlight as well. If being part of our email community is too much for you, you can just stalk us on social media. That's fine. Um, but truly, as Leopold closed the San County Almanac, nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. Uh, you all are part of the land ethic now and moving forward. And so we thank you for your land ethic and all the work that the College of Forestry here at Oregon State is doing collectively and each of you individually to advance this ethic of care and concern uh, for all people and all places. Thank you very much. I do think you. Oh, I probably got I don't think we can have both of these on at the same time. We'll just use that. One. Yeah, we'll just and we'll pass this around for questions. There we go. All right, everyone. At five o'clock, we'll have a reception out in the atrium. But until then, we can have some questions and dialogue. If buddy, we'll be here obviously for throughout. So, does anyone have any questions, comments, response, any good dialogue to begin here? And I personally want to thank you for that insightful look into Professor Leopold's life and legacy and the importance of his family. And yeah, in the back. From online. This is from our online audience, which we had over 85 joining us. So um, thanks for that. And they ask, how much was all the Leopold's influence by Native American um, and maybe some similar ethics of land stewardship. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. We that is actually an area that could use some additional research. Um, we know that he had some encounters with indigenous communities, both uh, up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and in the Southwest. Uh, but there's not a lot documented about or that we found uh, that has been documented about his interactions uh, with indigenous people. Um, the, the one thing that we can point to is that when the University of the Wisconsin Arboretum was established, where Leopold was the research director, uh, he was uh, emphatic that Chief Yellow Thunder of the Ho-Chunk Nation be part of that uh, opening and gathering. And uh, so that's the one piece of evidence that we have that he understood the importance of these other um, American or, you know, colonialized uh, American uh, perspectives that existed out there. During other parts in a, of his life, he did read pretty deeply about philosophy, Western and Eastern philosophy. So there were some other influences he did. Um, gather over his time and he tried to incorporate in his writings. But again, that's an area that could could uh, utilize additional research. So if anybody is looking at environmental history, a research opportunity, we would love to talk more about that. Yeah, Don? All those Leopold children, do they have families? Are there Leopolds out there growing up right now or are we now Leopold less? Okay, so the question was, <laughs> the question was, did the five children uh, have families of their own and what are they doing? Uh, several did. Um, interestingly, uh, a lot of the five kids' children kind of scattered. I think there was, you know, it was pretty dense canopy and conservation between Aldo and their parents. So many of them are artists and lawyers and business people and, and other things. But now uh, the great grandkids are coming back to science and conservation. Uh, and so, well, A, we always have family representation on the Leopold Foundation board. 
maybe not a scientist, but a family representation of some kind. Uh, but there is Jed Mounier is a disturbance ecologist in Wisconsin and is looking at the role of fire, uh, both cultural uh, and otherwise in our Midwest ecosystems. And Claire Kazansky is a scientist with the Nature Conservancy. So the tradition does continue, um, but it has diversified, shall we say, in terms of professional interest and, and pursuit. So here's a fun fact. Um, so uh, Hal Zaldwasser, who was a former dean, uh, now deceased of the College of Forestry, was Dr. Leopold Molasky. Can you switch off from both Yeah. Thanks, Claire. So um, Hal Zaldwasser, who was a dean in the College of Forestry that many of you knew, was Starker Leopold's last student. And after um, Hal passed, um, his widow gave me a copy of a Sand County Almanac that Starker had inscribed for Hal. Do you share your connection to the Oh, Oh, um, my great, great, my great grandmother was a cousin of Estella. And so to the question about indigenous blood, there's indigenous, lots of indigenous blood in my family. So Estella may have influenced all the Leopold's perspectives on indigenous knowledge. And he actually wrote an article in the early 1920s called Paiute Forestry about how what was wrong with the forests in the Southwestern US when he was cruising timber for the Forest Service was that cultural burning had been removed from them and uh, that had been replaced with cattle and the climate was changing. So he noted climate change back then. And so he wrote an article called Paiute Forestry that what we needed was to bring back those traditional land stewardship methods. So yeah, somebody should do more research on this. All right, other questions for Mr. Huffaker? Oh, well, all right. Well, let's go ahead and adjourn. Thank you all for your attendance for this first Starker Lecture of 2024. We're going to follow it up with one next week, April 10th, with our own Dr. Tom DeLuca as a speaker. And we will potentially be holding one in the fall. Stay tuned for more on that. And again, thank you all for your attendance today. And let's give one more thanks to Mr. Buddy Huffaker.